Keith. Rules are rules. <laughs> and as we look ahead uh, to uh, MotoGP and World Superbikes uh, racing at the weekend, just gone World Superbikes MotoGP back in action again straight away in Jerez. But of course, at the end of the month, uh, we go to Aston, which is where, of course, Superbikes has just raced. And there has been a little bit of controversy. Perhaps you'd like to paint the picture a little bit for us. Well, is there any um, part of a racetrack that's more iconic than the final chicane at Assen? I don't think there is anywhere in the world. I think it's the one that we have seen so much drama, so much action. Let's go back a couple of years when Marky Marquez stuck it under Valentino Rossi. Rossi, was he touched? Was he not? Doesn't matter really, because all he did was just sat on the back wheel and gassed it through the sand pit. Like, just straight lined it, motocross style. Of course, motocross drive, you want to keep the throttle lit, otherwise you're going to be straight over in the in the sand. So straight through he went and and obviously beat Marquez to the line. A um, little bit of, you know, furore behind the pit lane. Roll it forward to last weekend, this weekend, sorry, that's just gone. Um, Avara Batista has been penalised, in my view, for accuracy. He was millimetre perfect. The fat bit of the tyre was on the on the on the track on the on the curb as far as i'm concerned it wasn't on the green yeah there's a little bit of the tire overhung the green if you like but the fact was he was millimeter perfect the 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 tall part of the tire which is in the middle of it was on the the curb i defy what i've seen so far that that any of it touched the green stuff now he got penalized a place yeah okay it was rasgat the oglu who who gained a place where if you go back to Manny Cor, he lost a place when the big controversy about Jonathan Ray um, pointing out that Rasgadi Oglu had gone across the green. And that was, he did. He went, he, he cut the corner. Now, that one for me as well <laughs> shouldn't have been penalised because it had no advantage at all. It, you know, it made no advantage. And Jonathan passed him anyway, I think, the next corner. So, the, you know, but rules are rules again. We're back in the rules are rules. But I don't believe that Bautista touched the green. I think he's been unfairly penalised. And I think that we get to MotoGP later in Assen and they are going to be just as strict. I'm not sure whether whether World Superbike have the same systems as, as MotoGP. MotoGP have these sensors that are on the green. So if you touch it and set it off, you're done. I think that the World Superbike, I think are visual, aren't they? I don't think they do have the, the sensors like... Um, Motor GP. I might I stand corrected and then folks at home you can you can now swear at the screen and send me your comments regarding that. But I think visually, um Bautista was hard done by for accuracy. He was millimeter perfect. He'd ridden good all weekend and have a place taken away from him. As much as I'm a big fan of Top Rack, um I think Top Rack was lucky to have gained that place. And then we go to the other controversy down the other end of the track. You know, how many times? How many times? Have we seen a rider that's run a little bit deep, comes back to the line and comes together with those that have gone for the gap underneath him, as Jonathan Ray did? You know, no right. It's a racing incident as far as I'm concerned. I don't think anybody should be penalised. But there's the, the there's two arguments here. Top Rack should have been aware that as been run wide, someone is going to go for the hole in the middle that he's just left there. So he should know that coming back down to the line, there's probably going to be somebody that's underneath him. But you can argue Jonathan will also know that Top Rack's going to square it off and look to hit the apex that Jonathan is now on. So it's probably why it ended up being a, a tit for tat, you know, racing incident situation. But we see it all the time. Was it Danny Pedrosa at Jerez that, that came down and wiped out the Ducatis? Um, you know, massive crash with Jonathan. He'd run wide, pulled it back down and... and Base over Apex, everybody had gone up the street because he'd gone back for the gap and there was already somebody in it. We see it all the time. It's absolutely natural. If, if someone's run wide, you're going to go for that gap as Jonathan did. But if someone's run, run wide, you also know that the man who's run wide is going to look to square it off and come straight back to the Apex to try and get the run on the, on the next little straight. Racing incident, but still a mess. How can you make rules for that, Harry? You I don't can't. know. How can you, Pete? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all the, the Bautista thing with the, with the track limits. I know that some people might say, "Well, look, 
you know, why didn't he just give a bit more leeway? But this is what these guys do. This is what guys like Keith do. They push the limits to the very edge. I, I went to that very chicane a few years back. They altered the curbing there or something. So on the Thursday before the, the TT weekend began, went down to have a look at it, as, as you do, you know, because as Keith says, you know it's going to be a, a big action point of the weekend. Uh, Dobby happened to be down there and uh, you, know, you have a bit of a chat and he pointed out and this is the details that the guys like Keith and his top racers notice he said look at the white line you know where they paint the white line on the edge of the track it wasn't actually right on the edge of the track there was still about another two or three centimeters of sort of of tarmac on the other side of it you know this is the kind of details that racers look at so he's looking at going you know I can actually run over that line a little bit can I and there's still going to be a bit of track underneath me. This is the kind of, of, of limits and, and things that people are looking for. So Bautista, that's exactly what he was doing. He's running it right to the millimeter of that curb. And as Keith says, if you're doing it visually, I mean, I, I don't know how you could possibly make a call, you know, when it's so precise to that degree, as Bautista, he tweeted the picture, hasn't he? I mean, it's, I don't know, if, it, if it's just a visual thing, it's very, very difficult to call. I think penalised for being accurate. You're right, Pete. All the, you go around on a Thursday, for instance, the, the, the sighting apps, you can't do them on a scooter anymore because they were banned because it was two silly sods got caught up and, and had another crash. There was always crashes on scooters around there on a Thursday. So they're banned now. So all you can do is walk or run the race. I'm a walker, by the way. <laughs> but you would always check the inside curb as much as the outside curbs now. You know, where the overbanding is, Where where is there a gap between the... the the ripple strip blocks and the actual tarmac. Is there overbanding between the two, which you sometimes get? By that, I mean, you know, a strip of liquid tarmac that they fill the gap in between the two. And where the paint is, the paint really just covers it over a little bit sometimes. So there are places to, and plus, paint they use now quite often is grippier than the actual tarmac. So you get a launch off it on the inside curve. I mean, if you're looking through the inside, Mark Marquez used. You know, I remember he was the first guy that I ever noticed that used like hellish amounts of inside curb, really looked at getting drive off the inside curb. Whereas in the old days, it was like shiny Dulux and all you got was wheel spin. Once you got on there, you, you, were, you were, you know, out of it, really. I mean, even if it was if it was dry, I mean, if it's wet, it used to be even worse. So, you know, that's that's grippy, that paint. So the likes of Davizioso, I talked about him earlier on. He's the man of accuracy. He's an intelligent guy. He will have looked at all of that stuff, you know, as all riders do. That Thursday is the best day if you're a journalist to, to, to catch up with first-hand information. Walk that track a few times during the daytime and you'll always catch up with people that are out there with their team bosses. With the, you know, I mean, the amount of times I've caught up with, with techs that are out there trying to work out where there may be an advantage for them to offer their riders something different as well. It's quite interesting how much of a collaboration it is with all the team personnel. And they're all out on the racetrack on the Thursday having a good old nose at all these things. And trying not to give away too much to all the other teams that are wandering around, which is quite funny. Or the journos that are, that are wandering around, especially the journos Sticking that their noses in. might be able to interpret what they're talking about. So we're all out <laughs> on a Thursday <laughs> trying to um, fool everyone else. It's quite funny, really. Well, it's uh, it was certainly a, an action-packed weekend, certainly on, on two wheels. Uh, so uh, if you want to stay abreast of all the uh, latest World Superbike news as well, you can, of course, do that on Crash.net. Bautista, who leads uh, in the standings at the moment, 109 points to Ray uh, with 91. Razgatlioglu is third ahead of Locatelli. And former MotoGP man Ika Laquona into the top five. Got a podium at the weekend as well. Come on, Ika. Nice to see him doing well. I'll tell you what. Uh, how good is it at the moment, Harry, for Hondas? I mean, Honda, Glenn Irwin absolutely pissed the British Superbike round early on. I do excuse my language. I, I get excited. So he absolutely <laughs> blitzed the um, the BSB at uh, Silverstone on that horrible little short track, the national track. Won all three of the races. You know, Honda are flying at the moment. Ike Laquona, you're quite, he was your man, wasn't he? You've always been banged. I've Ike always been a firm track. supporter of Laquona. Thought he'd got done over in last year in MotoGP. So I'm he very did. happy to see him up there. Yeah, he did. You were right. Mm. Sympathy well, doesn't uh, go anywhere in motorbike racing, by the way, Harry. We don't care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good on. We'll get. I need. Well, the West, I think we should try and get Laquona on. I think we'll try and make that happen um, for all the Spanish fans we have of this podcast. Uh, right. Well, that's uh, some of the stuff uh, that happened, of course, this weekend. But uh, no rest for the wicked, really, because we're back once again, just a couple of days uh, in Jerez, in Spain, aren't we? Uh, for another round for MotoGP, uh, Keith. Well. 
take us round her F. What do you like about it? What do you don't like about One it? One of my favourite racetracks, I've got to say. The um, Come On You Crazy Diamond, when they used to play that on the way in in the morning as the sun came up and 200,000 people absolutely came like ants over the hills, no matter what the weather was or anything. It was just an outstanding venue. Um, great racetrack. I mean, they even ran Formula One round there, which is it seems a bit small for the likes of Formula One, perhaps, but a great motorcycle racetrack. And those last few corners down to the down to the hairpin are just spectacular. Um, you know, whether you go there for a test or whether you go there for, for full blown, I mean, you've got to go to a ref. It's another one of them ones. Andalusia anyway is a is a great region in Spain. Um, it's beautiful. It's warm. You know, like you're you're near the beach. What can, what more can I say? It's a it's a it's a great place to be. It's easy to get at. You know, you've got a nice drive if you're going to drive from. From up country, if you're going to come from Malaga or somewhere like that, you can do it easy in three hours, and it's a nice three-hour drive. Um, or you can get off at Gibraltar if you fancy, you know, going and seeing the rock. You can fly into Gibraltar and then go across the border into Spain, providing the Spanish aren't having a go at the British at that particular point in time. That, that usually gets a bit tricky, but anyway. Um, so it's one of those situations where you you you, you should be doing Jerez. It's a classic. It's the Spanish Grand Prix. Um, great viewing balconies and, and sort of amphitheatres as well. And, and plus the fact that, that, that the atmosphere, again, <laughs> it, do you know what? It's funny, isn't it? How old am I? And yet all the hairs on my arms are starting to go on end <laughs> just when I start talking about a bloody racetrack. I mean, I'm never going to grow out of this. Aren't I? Even when I'm dead, I'm going to be bloody still excited about it. It's, uh, huh. it's a great place to be. Um, it's a great racetrack. And... Again, we are going to see the likes of those corner speed kite merchants, Quattararo and co. are going to go good there. The Yamaha is, is going to go good there. The Suzuki is going to go good there. Um, and I think really Portugal has set us up really well for Jerez. I think that you know Mir is going to be somewhere on it. Quattararo is going to definitely be there. But if you remember, you go back to Jerez, you know, Bangaya was looking really good there on the Ducati just a couple of years ago. You know, he looked really, really good. So. You can't rule them all out. The thing I love about MotoGP is it's so close. Everybody's talking about whinging and moaning about thousands of a second that they're losing here and there, whether it be rear grip, front grip, middle grip, whatever it is. It's it's because everything is so tight, so close at the end of the day. Will the Aprilia perform there this time around again? I mean, you know, qualifying is going to be key here as well. You're going to need to get that qualifying done. You do not don't want to get caught up in a in a first lap melee if you can. So maybe Suzuki are just coming good at the time they need to. It's a real traditional track, isn't it? I know I know the European season has started with Portimao, but Portimao is very much a modern circuit, isn't it? It's got all these, you know, modern safety standards and everything else. Jerez in places is a bit is a bit short of runoff. And we've spoken before about the, the reasons with the bikes getting ever quicker. You know, it's 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 a very small track physically. It's very small, especially if you come from, say, when it used to be the first European round of the season. You come from overseas events, testing in Sepang, huge circuit, Qatar, huge circuit, and then you come to Jerez and this small, you know, in the in the valleys in between the sort of rocky hills, isn't it? And and there's this small sort of ribbon of of tarmac, and uh, yeah, very different track. As he says, you know, top speeds is not going to barely. They think I think they barely touch top gear around there. There's there's two straights, the main straight if you call it that, and and then a bit of a back straight as well, leading to what's now Danny Pedrosa corner. Yeah, well, it was Danny Pedrosa's uh, corner where he had all those guys off, wasn't it? What were you talking <laughs> was, about earlier that on? Was exactly what, <laughs> that was exactly what I was going to say. So, yeah, we could expect some action there. I, from, from from the F1 days, Harry, it's the same corner where uh, Villeneuve and Schumacher collided mm. during their title fight. That's now the Danny Pedrosa hairpin. So that'll be the main overtaking spot again, even for the bikes as well. So, yeah, I mean, what, how do we predict? Well, we're going to try, aren't we? But it's so difficult. We've had so many... Bagnaia was very fast, even at the... As he said, Ducati went well last year. They went well in last November's test as well. They were they were on fantastic form, but, you know, yet they come here uh, still with Bagnaia looking for a podium. I mean, it, it's... Weather makes close, a difference they, at Jerez. It depends on just what that track temperature, where that is, what window it's in. Quite often you find that the early tests, or the late ones as you were talking about there, the track is quite a bit cooler and they've got real performance out of the tyres there. You know, the time of the year we're going, it's going to start warming up a bit there. Um, so it'll be interesting to see whether whether that has any bearing on, on who does what where. And, and there will be a, a test on the Monday, the, the sort of an in-season test. So that's a big, you know, important moment for 
teams like Honda and Ducati. I mean, all of them, of course, they need testing, but certainly guys that maybe feel they didn't get everything done with their new bikes, shall we say, during the winter, this is a, a big chance for them on the Monday. So it's going to be a big weekend and a, and a busy one. Um, so, yeah, you've got guys, as we say, luckily, well, Ralph Fernandez, we should say, missed, obviously, last weekend's race, but he should be back for this weekend. But certainly you wouldn't want to pick up an injury. It's this compressed schedule that we spoke about previously with all these races. You know, potentially you could not only miss a race, you could miss a test as well. People might think, well, what, a one-day test? But seven hours of track time, that's, what do you get in a Grand Prix weekend? About four hours, probably? So it's the chance for some really serious running when you get these day of testing. It's so valuable to them that, well, they're going to be keeping their fingers crossed, as Keith says, about the weather, for one thing. I mean, let, let's hope they get good weather for it. But yeah, big, big important moment there. And, and I suppose also on testing, if we bring up Aprilia, they're now one podium away from losing concessions after Aleish's uh, performance. So they, uh, I think testing is the one thing that disappears straight away. So if, if Aleish gets on the podium uh, this weekend, or Maverick, they won't be able to do private testing. It doesn't affect official testing, of course, but they'll be basically under the same rules as all the others, right from the moment they get this last concession point that they need to get to six. And uh, yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, well, you've got to believe it pretty are going to do it. I mean, with, with the, they've had two podiums already. Obviously, they had another one at Silverstone last year that the points are added up over a period of two years. So uh, you've got to believe it pretty will be out of concessions this year. Well, that brings us on nicely to our predictions actually no before we do our predictions i'm assuming we all caught jorge lorenzo in the porsche super cup action at the weekend no I, no i, I um Silence. my colleague at crash lewis lewis did send me a picture of uh, of lorenzo on the grid so yes and and you did uh, you did alert me to it as well I harry <laughs> so. i think i sent you both a text message right before the weekend <laughs> lorenzo's in the super cup he, uh, uh, that was uh, all the you can catch up on uh, on the socials or channels. Good to see two another two wheeler going into four wheels. Um, but uh, he was at the back. It's tough to to adapt. I think in that championship. Anyway, predictions, please. Uh, Keith, come on then. Cough them up. Whoa. You're in the lead, by the way, with five points. Pete mm -hmm. is currently in second in one, and I'm yet to get off the mark still. Well, I mean, I'd love to claim it's um, my superior knowledge and so on and so forth, but you know damn well it's not. It's just bloody luck um, because MotoGP is so tight. Um, I have this burning desire to have a double Suzuki podium this weekend. Why did you want that, Harry? You can't, yes, but you go first. Go on. Well, we can always have the same. same we, can, we, can. Like. we can, we can, we no, can, we can, we can. But Go I just, I, I, it has to be Quattararo and two Suzuki's for me. I mean, I, I'm, 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 okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw the, the caution. Um, I, I, Anaya Bastianini, I quite fancied Anaya Bastianini as well as, as, as being on there. I'll tell you what, I'll put, I'll, 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 I'll go three ways. Then I'll go Quattararo for the win. Mia for second place and Anaya for third place. I'll leave you one Suzuki. You can, you can play with that. If you like. You're too kind. All right. Well, then, Quartararo, Mia, Bastianini. Lock that in. Pete, what you got? Quartararo for the win as well. I think it's not a top speed track. We saw what he did last Sunday. So I think it's different. And of course, he was leading last year, wasn't he? Comfortably until he had this arm pump problem. So. That was what sort of cost him the win there, but I mean he was he was looking strong last year as well. So, and then going back to the previous year, he won both of those 2020 season openers. So yeah, it, it's hard to see beyond Quattro. If he can win in Portimao, I think uh, he's got to be the favourite for this weekend. Uh, I, I will go Bastianini second. I think that uh, the GP21 goes well there. I, obviously, the wrist. I don't know. He, he didn't seem too troubled by it during the race. So I think he. Again, especially if it's hot, as Keith says, the grip levels could be lower if it's a lot hot, hotter temperatures. So things like the tyre wear will become more important and we know how good he is with that. So, and, you know, I'm going to go Aleish third. I'll go Aleish on the Aprilia third and uh, finish the concessions, shall we say, there and then. Yeah, solid, solid. Well, I'm going to go for a Suzuki win. I'm going to go for redemption for Joan Mir. Uh, he finished fifth there last year and I feel... He's strong amongst the Suzukis. Well, they're both strong, aren't they? But uh, Mir is my winner. And I'm going to go for Quartararo second, I think. And you know what? I wanted to put Aleish third as well. So I'm just going to copy on that one. I'm going to put Aleish there. Because where, where did he come last year? He came sixth last year. So, you know, strong form around there. 
Uh, or maybe I should put Rins first because Kim. Kim's gonna, oh. <laughs> I used to be indecisive, but I'm not sure now. Uh, no, I'm going to leave that. Mir, Quattarara, and Alay. So at least we've got all sorts of slightly different ones. Well, those are our predictions. Let us know yours as ever in the comments below. Um, some people do get them spot on. We do read them, so you know, keep sending them in in the in the uh, comments section below uh, and wherever you. Uh, listen or watch us as well always a pleasure to have you company um but i think that just about does it just a couple of days until Haref jensen will be right back here so my thanks as always to pete mclaren and keith hewin uh, i've been harry benjamin make sure you stay tuned in across crash.net for all the latest news and analysis across the week and then as i just said we'll be back with you next week to look back at all things Haref. get your questions in leave them in the comments section or tweet instagram facebook us just search crash moto gp leave us a review if you can as well wherever you get your podcasts and we shall see you right back here next week bye bye